Okay, so good afternoon. Maybe uh, I will present myself. So I'm Salsa Bill. I'm a journalist in Hint. And uh, thank you, first of all, for taking the time to, uh, to do this interview. So maybe you can introduce yourself. Absolutely. My name is Valentin Troll. I am a professor for geosciences and I work here in Uppsala University, Sweden. I'm also a research associate at uh, the University in Las Palmas de Gran Canaria. And I have been working in the Canary Islands for more than 20 years now. And uh, of course, the uh, uh, eruption last year, the 2021 eruption has been uh, one of the major interests of myself because uh, the eruptions in the Canary Islands are kind of rare. And the last one was 2011, but it was submarine. And the one before was 1971 which is the year I was born. So it's a great opportunity for me to see a live eruption. Therefore, yeah. my research interest has, of course, focused on that. Yeah. And how did the this eruption compare to the other ones? How did it change? And are there big differences between this eruption and the submarine one or the, the previous one? That's a very good question in the sense that uh, all the historical eruptions, meaning the eruptions of the last... 500 years that were all over the archipelago, um, they are of a very similar nature, uh, geologically speaking. They follow the rift zones, that's these long ridges usually, or fractures, and uh, they are therefore aligned, they follow alignments. And uh, in the case of La Palma, it's the Cumbre Vieja Ridge, this long ridge that you have in the south of the island. And there, um, fractures break open and then you have cones, these uh, mountains that build up in uh, one single eruption. They're not revived very frequently and uh, they emit lava, but they also build the cone from the tephra, from the ash fall. And uh, the submarine eruption was likely very similar, but we couldn't see it. But the 1970 eruption, the 1949 eruption, as well as the 1909 eruption on Tenerife, they were all of this type. And uh, therefore, we have a good idea how these eruptions work in the Canaries. But the size may differ a little bit, but the fundamental processes of this eruption type has remained the same for at least the last 500 years. Okay, really impressive. And um, how did uh, the volcano, uh, uh, how was it monitored? And did the scientists know beforehand? And how did they know? And how did they monitor it? Absolutely, yes. That's a very good point. And um, the eruption was anticipated by the scientists, maybe not so much by the local population, but the scientists knew that something was coming. There was already some swelling of the ground uh, in 2011. So there was initial indications. And since 2017, there was more earthquakes. These are very weak earthquakes. They are only uh, measurable with instruments. You don't feel them, they're very small. But there were several swarms of earthquakes in 2017, 2020. So the scientists knew that something was in the bush. And then in uh, 2021, early September, there was suddenly a little bit more earthquake activity. And in the week before the eruption, this is when the earthquakes got very intense and very frequent. And uh, then they were heralding that an eruption was imminent. And the earthquakes, they have progressed along the ridge and also higher up. And uh, within a few days prior to the eruption, it was clear that an eruption will occur. The problem with monitoring this is that you don't know exactly where the eruption will occur. And this is often a problem. And some people said, oh, maybe the authorities should have evacuated earlier. But if you don't know exactly know where the volcano will occur, yeah. you cannot really evacuate. So the, the, the strange thing is you need to wait until the eruption starts. And then you can say, now it's time to go. Otherwise, you may evacuate people that are not at risk, and it's going to be very costly, very chaotic, and uh, very problematic. So yeah. that's the story about that. Scientists knew it was coming, but the local population may have not fully understood the significance of this. Yeah, and how did 
So eventually when it erupted, the, um, the municipalities know beforehand to be prepared for the evacuation. They had contact with the scientists or not at all? Absolutely. Um, the good thing and the bad thing was that there was this submarine eruption in 2011. And some people have criticized the authorities that it was not perfectly managed. It was actually mismanaged, some people said. There was this rather famous newspaper article saying how to not manage a volcanic eruption in 2011. And um, the authorities had the opportunity to learn there. And many of the mistakes or apparent mistakes from 2011 were not repeated. So there was um, a very good correspondence between authorities and municipalities from a scientific point of view. Some of the local uh, people with whom I spoke, they would have liked to have more information, but yeah. there was a committee called the Pevolka Committee, that's the uh, Volcano Emergency Committee, and this had representatives from all the main institutes, the main uh, monitoring institutes, as well as the universities, as well as other um, uh, official bodies. And this committee was advising the local uh, municipalities, the mayor, the cabildo, the government of the island. And uh, they were meeting every day and they were looking during the eruption every day. And they were looking how things are evolving and they were advising if new evacuations are needed, if certain areas can be repopulated at the end of the eruption and things like that. So uh, this was uh, quite exemplary. And as a scientist, you had to apply to this committee, the Pevolka committee to get permission to actually enter the uh, exclusion okay. zone and do research. And how about uh, future eruptions? Uh, do we have any ideas? Will there be sooner? Because now it's been 15 years since the uh, really the eruption, uh, uh, apart from the submarine eruption, but it's been 50 years. In the future, can we know if there will be more eruptions? This is a very good question. I'll quickly share my screen. I hope this yeah. works now. I hope you can see that. Can you see my screen and the table? Yes, I can see it. Wonderful. Let me just see whether I can make this a little bigger. So here is the historical eruptions of the Canary Islands. And okay. uh, we had an eruption on La Palma in 1585, 1646, 1677. Then there was a break of a few decades, and then there was one in 1712. And then there was a long break of over 200 years, and the next one was 1949. And then quickly afterwards, one in 1971, and now one in 2021. So yeah. there seems to be rhythms, but uh, we have too few data in order to really appreciate what the long-term rhythm is. And therefore we can only use the statistics from these six or seven eruptions there. So, and uh, including the new one at seven. Now, if we do the calculations on uh, this, then the statistics is, it's statistics of small numbers, I'm afraid, but it says yeah. that the probability of an other eruption in uh, the Cumbre Vieja is about 50% for the next 50 years. So within the next 50 years, there is a 50-50 chance of another eruption, but there may also be none. That's the reality. Yeah. So there could be another 200 year gap. There could be only a 50 year gap. There could be only a, a smaller gap even. So, um, what I am sure about is that there will most likely be another eruption on the Cumbre Vieja, but we are not entirely sure when, and that okay. is the big unknown. Okay, and uh, how, how was and what was the effect on the local population of this eruption? Because it was really, I mean, the images we all saw all over the world were, were really um, sad but impressive also uh, all the lava that was flowing and all the houses but also the plantations so what were the, the effects on the local population absolutely this is exactly the issue i mean uh, this is this uh, how to say this is this uh, dilemma that we face with volcanoes and let me see i i tried to get another slide for you i have a little summary slide here um this is this uh, dilemma it's the beauty and the beast or the terrible beauty as it's sometimes called. Of course, it's fascinating scientifically speaking, 
on the other side, it can cause great suffering for the local population. And in this case, the eruption was in a very densely populated area. The 1917 eruption, uh, 71 eruption, uh, was in the southern end of the island and was far less populated. So there was very little drama uh, apart from the natural beauty. But uh, this eruption was very different. And um, so I trust you can see my screen now. I think I lost you now. Let's try again. Can you see my screen now? Yes, I can see it perfectly. Wonderful. So the eruption lasted for 85 days, and that means a lot of people had to evacuate their uh, homesteads, their houses, their properties for a long time. If you had a business, you couldn't run your business. That's a big financial loss. Almost 8,000 uh, 8, people were evacuated, and uh, more than 2,800 buildings were destroyed. Of these, uh, 1,300 were houses, and then uh, 1,500 or so utility buildings. Almost uh, 1,000 hectares of plantation and farmland were uh, covered. Of this, about 350 hectares by lava. That's irrecoverable. The rest by pyroclastics, by tephra and ash. That is hopefully recoverable, but it's a lot of work. Then there's over 70 kilometers of vital roads that were cut. And this of course is a major infrastructural problem. But the good news is there was no direct loss of human life. And that's a huge achievement for an eruption like that. But the estimates in terms of the damage are on the order of 1,000 million euro, a billion euro. Okay. This is a huge amount of money that got lost. And for a small island, this is uh, devastating for the economy. Yeah. And yeah, indeed. And, uh, and more specifically about the agriculture parts, there are a lot of uh, magma. And I don't know if you can call it magma. The, so the black thing that you see on the lands, will it ever be, uh, will we ever be able to use it as agricultural land again? If so, is there a process to turn it back into agricultural land? Well, this is a very interesting problem. It actually is a problem that was previously observed in the Canaries when you think back to the 1730 eruption on Lanzarote. What they noted back then is that areas with a thin, lever, uh, um, a thin layer of ash or tephra, as we call it in science, uh, the ash and little particles, the little stones, um, if it's a thin layer, yeah. it's good for the land. If it's a thick layer, the plants will die. So the trick is to have only a thin layer. So for areas that were far away that have a thin layer, this will in the next few years be good for the plants. But areas that are close to the volcano where the layer was thick, that's bad. And there the ash might need to be removed. And uh, ultimately the ash can be reused. It can be reused in agriculture for spreading it on many areas. In part, it could also be spread on the new lava delta, that's the land in the sea, the new land. They add a lot of this ash, they could make it fertile if they want to do that. But okay. um, another way of using it is you can use it in buildings, in building projects. You can use it as a concrete supplement. And uh, we currently use a lot of aggregates, a lot of solid material to supplement concrete. And um, this might be something else because uh, the ash that's been removed from the roads has been piled up in large mountains. And yes. this, I think, will be used for building uh, supplements in the future. Yeah. And who uh, is responsible of the extra land that was created now? The land is officially owned by the government now. And uh, the government of Spain, uh, the, the country of Spain, owns the land. And there's currently a discussion about what to use the land for. Previously, the land was very frequently used for plantations because the lava platforms, the 1971 lava platform is uh, to a large degree now plantations. The land was uh, uh, made available for farmers to purchase and uh, some of it is still protected for scientific reasons, but uh, most of it is uh, plantation land. But 
The current um, discussion is, should it be preserved for future generations? Could it be a volcano park? In other parts of the island, for example, on the eastern side of the island, some of the old lava platforms, the deltas, uh, the lava deltas, they have been used for building hotels on. You could also build nice, beautiful hotels on and therefore bring new revenue to the island from tourism. And uh, of course, some other people say, oh, you should give it to the population. You should put uh, plantations on to grow bananas, tomatoes, pineapples, and things like that, and bring more money to the island this way. So what ultimately will be decided by the government, I don't know, but these are the three main options that are currently discussed. Okay, and is there an issue of drainage uh, on the parts where there is, uh, or those ashes? Well, I think um, there's different problems in different areas. When we think of the lava delta, part of the problem is that there may be instabilities because there could be open areas, little lava tunnels, little um, open spaces inside. So partly there might still be areas that will sink. And this is the same for the, um, for the lava area on land. There could be lava tunnels underneath and therefore you have to really dig very carefully and put pressure on. When they built the new road that only opened a few days ago um, at the beginning of the month, they made sure that there was heavy equipment gradually moving into the lava flow, ensuring that there is no collapse underneath it, there is no open spaces. When it comes to um, the tephra areas, the ash layers, there is, of course, issues. These are not consolidated. So you might actually develop with time groundwater flow in them. This could cause areas to wash away. So this could also cause all sorts of instabilities in the long run. If you have groundwater flow, this could be problematic. But the good thing is that um, the rainfall is not so high and it's seasonal. So I think it's important to wait for a little while, for example, a few years, and then you will see which areas are affected by this and which are not. Those areas you want to cultivate for agriculture, again, those can be cleared off when the uh, tephra layer is thick. And if the tephra layer is thin, it's not a problem anyway, because then um, it should be good for the land. And if it's washed away, it's not a major problem. So unfortunately, waiting may be the case for those areas where the tephra is very thick. Yeah. And is there a specific uh, place where the road had to be uh, built uh, or not? Or was it no matter where? Absolutely. There is a specific place. Let me just um, maybe show you something here. I think I had a map of this. The uh, lava thickness is variable. And uh, where the lava is still thick, there is, of course, not a good way to build. And uh, let me see if I can share again. I trust you can see my screen now? Yes, I can see it. Yes. So this is the lava field. This is the volcano. And uh, close to the volcano, the lava is really thick. And uh, this upper map is very complicated. This is the different lava pulses, but we don't need to worry about that. It's this lower map that's important here. This is the lava thickness. And the yellower the colors, the thicker the material. And you see the cone is, of course, 300 meters thick. So this is really yellow. And then here, we have a lot of yellow in the center of the lava flow and down here at the coast. So here, where the lava is thick, it's still hot inside. And it's still very warm. And that's not a good place. The old road, the LP2 road, was going through here. But the new road, it's cutting down here where the lava is less thick. So that heat doesn't become a huge problem. And also that uh, the chances of collapse is not so much of a problem. So this is why it's now um, built in this area, this new connecting road. It's now been tarmacked as well. They're putting asphalt on this new road. So uh, it's still a one-way street, I understand, but soon, hopefully, it's wide enough to actually have dual traffic. And then I think it will bring a huge advantage to the local population because they don't have to drive all around the island anymore. They can just go across the lava flow because 
The uh, short trip from, say, Las Manchas to Los Llanos, which took half an hour in the old days, uh, it took several hours um, now okay. since the roads were cut off. And that uh, to bring that back to normality will be a huge improvement for the population. Yeah. And uh, how is there a way? Because um, if I understand from your, uh, your paper you wrote, you compared it to with Hawaii, uh, where there are a lot of uh, eruptions there and where the municipalities find found a way to be able to build roads and build buildings, uh, knowing that there are a lot of volcano eruption. Is there a way that uh, in La Palma they can do the same? And how would it look like? It's actually interesting that you say that because um, there was discussion about a road there is a dirt track. It was closed during the eruption, but there was a dirt track that was going behind the volcano, but on the western side of uh, the Cumbre Vieja. And uh, I have a little uh, YouTube video in case you're interested where we're driving this dirt track during the eruption, but you needed a four wheel drive. And there was discussion that maybe these tracks should be, uh, should be covered with asphalt, with tarmac, so that in case of emergencies, there's just more potential roads to bring things backwards and forwards. That doesn't take away the possibility that some of these roads will be cut, but the denser the road network, the better the chance of having operational roads when, criti uh, when critical situations arise. Now, um, the um, lava doesn't care so much about roads, unfortunately, when you have an eruption, some roads will be cut off, but uh, therefore it's not much you can do. You have to just accept that this will happen. And all you can really do is have more roads that connect things so that you can supply situations or little villages that are otherwise cut off. The decision at the time was that to put tarmac on that road was not a priority because obviously the people that were evacuated are a priority. And I think now there's um, considerations to put tarmac on these little uh, dirt tracks through the forest in order to prepare for a future eruption. And during the eruption, I can see that this is not the most important thing, but what has been happening is there has been now connecting roads um, on the southern side of the lava flow because uh, the lava flow cut some um, east-west connections as well. And uh, therefore there was need to kind of bring new roads in to allow to go back down to Guatanaos, for example, which uh, was cut off as well. Okay. And uh, you said that previously that uh, in previous uh, eruptions, land was used for banana plantations. Uh, they were only, uh, Thick, there were not thick uh, lands, or were they? Because you you had to figure out if the layer are, were thick or thin. So I presume that they have to figure out if the if it's a thin layer, then it can be planted on it. Did I let understand me, it correctly? Let me show this to you. I'll uh, try to use my material here to visualize this. So here you can see my screen now. Yes. So let me let me show you this uh, this image here. That's a satellite image from NASA, and uh, here's the Cumbre Vieja. This is where the 1971 eruption and the 1677 eruption was. The new eruption was here. So this image is from before the eruption and affected this area here, okay. and this area is a lot more populated because it's less steep. Now, the uh, lava platforms down here, they are from previous eruptions, 1712, 1949, that's here. And also the 1971 lava platform is partly down here. And uh, what happens down here is that they put a little bit of soil and lapilli on these lava platforms. The platforms itself are not good for agriculture. You have to supplement it with soil and lapilli. So basically the ash and lapilli from here, lapilli are the little stones, they are brought down here and they are added and to make an even surface and that can be used for agriculture. The local people call it pecan, uh, that's the little stones and it's great for agriculture because uh, it has these little bubbles, it has little uh, spaces inside, so it stores a lot of water. It's really good for plants in a hot climate and uh, this is what it is. And um, uh, yeah, this is what we see. And here is a picture of the new um, 
lava delta when it was forming. This was from a Dutch newspaper from December 2021. They spoke to me about uh, the lava platform and this was the lava platform in the making. And if you pave this a little, if you add more ash, if you add a little bit of soil, you could also make fields, plantations there, put greenhouses on top and you could grow things there. So this is some images of the lava platform, the new lava platform in the northern part. There's two new four platforms, and this is the northerly one, and we are looking at it from above here. And this is me posing in front of the lava platform that formed here in the south, just uh, because I had an opportunity to go there. So this one was near Porto Naos, and the other one is a little bit uh, further north towards Los Llanos. Yeah. I don't know what's going to happen. Personally, I would like to see that at least one of these lava platforms could be made into a volcano park, and this would also bring revenue for tourism. But I also understand that the local people have lost a lot of farmland, and maybe some of it could be made into farmland. Maybe different solutions could be applied to different parts of the lava platform system. Okay, and how did uh, the eruption change your own personal life, private or your work life? Oh, oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> I've been down there now several times and this was of course during the Corona pandemic. I didn't travel for something like two years and then the eruption uh, started, but obviously this was very important. Being a research associate there and having a long-term interest um, this required me to travel. So uh, luckily I escaped Corona so far and uh, this was a little tough on my family because obviously they have to be at home and I'm traveling the world. Uh, the other thing is, and this is very personal now, um, while I was there, I started to develop a strange toothache and I went to the, to the uh, dentist and they told me that um, I must have put too much pressure at night on one of my tooth. Uh, probably because of stress when you're dealing with a volcano. And so the tooth cracked and they had to remove that tooth. So I lost the tooth because of the eruption. <laughs> so, but that was my personal experience. Otherwise, I mean, scientifically, it was um, amazing. And um, I don't know whether you're interested, but um, we had the BBC out there. We had a film team out there. And just um, now on BBC Earth, they will show this episode where we're doing the work out there. So from a scientific point of view, um, the uh, samples we got, the information we got, the understanding about volcanoes in the Canaries we got is just unparalleled. So I think in a way, I think I'm okay paying a tooth for this. <laughs> <laughs> and was there something specific from the, the data you collected that you really that really popped out from everything that you collected? Was there really something that popped out of the, uh, everything that you did? Well, there's a number of things. I mean, some of them are very academic, but uh, um, early in the eruption, for example, we had uh, strange white fragments of rock coming up. And uh, these were very peculiar. We've seen something similar in the past in some older eruptions. And uh, this is very interesting because uh, they turn out to be uh, melted, partly melted sedimentary fragments from under the island. So we actually have some material now that is older than the island on which the island is based. So these volcanoes help us to look under the island, geologically speaking, which is kind of fascinating. So maybe I can show you one. I have a picture of this here in my uh, material that I prepared. And uh, sure. here we go. I'll share my screen once more. So these are some of the fragments that were picked up. And um, this is this white material. It's rich in quartz uh, for those people who are interested in that. And that's typical for material that came from Africa. And this is what we find under the island. So here we have some messages. I just sent some of this material now to a team of uh, paleontologists and they will look for fossils in there. So maybe we can even date these rocks and be more specific about it. And uh, this is uh, how they also look when they're smaller. These are some of the fragments in the um, deposits, in the tephra deposits. And We've seen similar rocks floating um, in 2011 at El Hierro, 
but this is one from La Palma, this is one from El Hierro. So this was a very, very useful exercise. Now, another uh, new uh, knowledge that we've gained is that we have a pretty good understanding now where these magma chambers are sitting, where the magma is stored because of the earthquake depth. And there was two levels of earthquakes. One level was at about 15 kilometer depth and the other one at about 35. So we knew that this eruption was fed from two magma chambers, not just one. And that helps us a lot to understand how the flow of magma works. And I think this is also partly, let me show you another image. This is um, partly, we think, a potential explanation for the different intensities of the eruption. Here we have in the lower part, we have, uh, let me see whether I can make this a little larger. Here we have the earthquakes, seismic events here per day. This is before the eruption. This was earthquakes just before the eruption. This is September last year. And this is during the eruption, this part here. And what we see is there's ups and downs, ups and downs, ups and downs, and then some big ups and big downs. And just towards the end, just in December, when some people said the eruption will almost shut down, it will stop soon. It got very intense for a short while and then it calmed down again. So there was a big um, uncertainty for the local population and for the scientists as well. Uh, each time it was going down, people were thinking, oh, it's gonna be over soon. And then it came back. And we think that uh, the fact that there's two magma reservoirs above each other, that's why we have ups and downs. It's like two fluid reservoirs that need to be filled and that communicate and that makes it very complicated. So you have magma flowing from one into the other. And once this is full, it will erupt. And the balance between how much comes out and how much flows in, that will cause the intensity shifts. Therefore, we have learned that the ups and downs, the intensity shifts in the eruption are not a good parameter. Also, what we have learned is that the sulfur that came out, the sulfurous gas was most intense towards the end. Many people say that if we have higher sulfur, it has says that the volcano will erupt soon, but actually it was the magma from depth that came late and it had the highest sulfur. So some of the things that we assume to know about volcanoes are no longer true after this eruption. And we learned a lot, honestly, a lot. Yeah. And uh, how did, uh, what are the health effects on the local population? Because I, I presume that uh, living here, is it so or is it a presumption? Well, there is problems, of course. During the eruption, there was a lot of gas and gas is still a problem. I understand that certain parts uh, near Porta Naos are still at risk. There's still CO2. CO2 is a very dangerous gas because you cannot smell it. It doesn't smell and uh, CO and CO2, but it's heavier than air. So it collects in depressions like in basements and valleys and things like that. And it makes what's what we call a gas trap. You cannot see it, you cannot smell it, but if you're in there, you will get no air. So you need to uh, have a device that measures the amount of oxygen in the air. And this is why certain parts near Porta Laos are still closed because there's too much CO and CO2. Another problem is uh, sulfur. And during the eruption, it was mainly um, SO2 coming out. And that really stinks if you inhale it. It's really intense. It's, it's acidic. It's very bad. Now it smells more like rotten eggs. And that's H2S. It's, um, it's when the sulfur and uh, combines with water, groundwater, rainwater, um, and, and precipitation water of any sort, morning dew, etc. And um, volcanoes that are, that are not active but have geothermal activity, they often smell of rotten eggs. It's very, so not a good smell but it's not so dangerous. But during the eruption, there was really acidic fumes. And if you get too much of that, that will burn your lungs. So scientists had to wear gas masks and authorities as well. And um, people had to be evacuated from areas where there was too much SO2 in the air. The bigger problem for the population of the entire island, however, is the dust. There is increasing levels of dust in the air because of the volcano. 
There's always a dust problem in the Canaries because there's a lot of wind coming from Africa and it brings a lot of fine dust particles. And it's particularly the tiny particles, the uh, smaller one that uh, the fraction of less than 10 microns because they stay in your lungs and they don't come out. Actually, I can show you an image here. We um, looked at some ash um, in the laboratory here. And um, here it is, I'll bring this up on the screen again. So this is a layer of ash that uh, we sampled and we dug the different layers. And these are layers are coming from different episodes in the eruption. But if you look at these particles here with the tweezers, see the tiny little sharp edges. Yeah. And uh, this is because of the bubbles. When the bubbles expand, it rips the material. And this was one bubble. Here was another bubble. Here was another bubble. And it makes these pointy edges. And if these tiny particles are then are inhaled with these sharp edges, you will never, ever get them out of your lungs again. They might even pierce little lung um, bubbles, little particle, uh, little um, uh, cells in your lungs, and they can uh, cause long-term damage. African dust is usually rounded grains, and having them in your lungs is not good, but they will not pierce the tissue. But these particles, they can pierce the tissue, and uh, this is therefore very dangerous. So. Uh, I released some videos um, uh, during the eruption when I was talking about the volcano and I had uh, sometimes only a COVID mask on my face because there was no gas. But then people were commenting and you, and you know, some people didn't like your COVID masks and they were coming, why do you wear a mask in your video? And people didn't understand. It was because of the particles in the air. Of course, if I'm standing there on my own, it's not about COVID, but if there's dust in the air, I don't want to breathe that in. So, <laughs> and therefore it was actually quite good having a lot of COVID masks with us. I had a hundred pack in my in my backpack and it was uh, quite frequently that even if there was no gas problem, yeah. you didn't need the gas mask, but there was dust in the air. And uh, that is still a bit of an issue because if you have winds, there's still ash dust that could be picked up by the winds. And in windy days, it will still be a problem on the island for some time in the future. Yeah. And so how long I advise you to bring your mask as well, actually. <laughs> and windy yes. I should have thought about it. <laughs> and how long do you think it will last? How many years before all the particles? And actually before we can, uh, the islands can go back to before the, the eruption? Well, the reality is there is no before the eruption. We cannot go back. Uh, some houses are just destroyed and there is no way of recovering them. Maybe in some areas we can build on the lava again but we cannot go back to what was before. This is exemplified in uh, Lanzarote. There was a big eruption in 1712, uh, sorry, 1730. 1712 was an eruption on La Palma. Uh, 1730 to 36 was an eruption on Lanzarote. And there was one village that was entirely covered by lava. There, the people of the village resettled on top of the lava. And then only a few years ago, they tried to build some new, what was it, library or sports facility, I forgot, but then they dug into the lava and they actually reached the level of the old village. And the old village is, of course, still under the new village. And they left this open. They decided to not build this building in the end because they realized that they could actually look into the history of the village before the eruption. So this is a stark reminder that it will not go back to what it was before. It can only be different. There is no way we can set back time or set back geology. Um, this will not be possible. Many of the houses will be covered. Many of the, uh, con uh, many of the, the plantations that are affected by lava, it will never be recovered in this way as it was before. And is there a way on also on climate level and on health level? So for example, the particles you said that are in the wind, is there a way that this can go away or will there also be always particles in uh, the air? 
Yes, um, there will be uh, particles in the air for some time, but ultimately the wind will take away the small particles and the easy to move particles. So it should get better with time, but it will take a little bit more time for this to happen. Uh, climate, I think, um, of course, volcanic eruptions affect the climate on a global level, but the La Palma eruption was not big enough to have a huge effect on climate but it will affect the local climate in the sense that uh, now there may be different flows of water. There will be different ways. The wind might blow on the Eastern side because now there's a cone and the wind might go a little different. So there will be different microclimates for certain areas. So a house that may have been in wind flow may no longer be in the wind flow now or the other way around. So this will of course happen. Microclimate will be affected, but the global climate will not be affected in a major way from this eruption alone. For that, the eruption was not big enough. Yeah, and maybe to close on a on a good note, is is there a, a positive? Um, I mean, is there a hope for the future? And is there something? I mean, in all the the chaos and all all that has happened, which is really, uh, I mean, it's sad for everybody. But is there something good that uh, resulted? or that could come out of uh, this eruption? I think there's a number of good things. There is um, a silver lining, so to speak. There is, uh, there is some good things amongst the bad things. And in fact, there's a Spanish saying is that there's nothing bad that isn't also good for something. And uh, this is what we see here as well. The good thing is there is now a lot of knowledge that was gained, not just scientifically, but also how to manage eruptions. There is now confidence that the authorities can manage these type of eruptions without loss of life. That's a huge achievement. And of course, there's loss of um, um, properties, there's loss of monetary values that are associated with uh, infrastructure. But I think a big lesson will be how to handle this in the future in terms of insurances on Hawaii. We uh, have uh, already insurances that cover against volcano damage. And I think this may be something the um, authorities need to encourage for the local population that insurances are covering these damages. Because if you're evacuated and you lose your property, but if you get this all paid, if you even get um, a hotel paid while the eruption goes on, it's not as bad. It's annoying, but it's not life threatening. It's not that your livelihood is lost. So this is a big lesson to be learned. And in the long run, I also think that uh, because of this eruption, there will be a huge wave of volcano tourism. There will be more people coming to the island now. I have a friend, um, Wim, I uh, shared um, the contact details with you. He works on the island in the tourist sector. And he says, there's already a lot of people coming just to see the volcano. So there is a new attraction there. Volcanoes are just this, force of nature and of course we humans feel very small we find it inspiring awesome in fact literally awesome and uh, of course people want to see it so and uh, this could be developed into a stronger attraction and therefore bring you money and uh, revenue to the island in a slightly different way than before yeah okay thanks a lot for the interview it was really interesting thanks my pleasure. So thank you very much. And um, yeah, let me know if there's any further questions um, um, down the road. Uh, when you write up your report, etc, then I'd be of course available for you.